Welcome to Ahval. I'm Zeynep Dijli, and with me today is Dilek Kurban, fellow and lecturer at the Herty School of Governance in Berlin. Kurban wrote a book called Limits of Supranational Justice, the European Court of Human Rights and Turkey's Kurdish Conflict last year. And we are going to talk about what that journey has been like a little bit today. Welcome, Dilek. How Thank are you, you today? Zeynep. Good, good. It's a sunny day okay. here in Berlin, so I feel good. Uh, yeah, <laughs> great. Um, okay, so let me just start quickly. Your book is a really, it's a heavy book. In the beginning of your book, you talk about human stories from Silopi and Gizre, Kurdish towns in the southeast of Turkey in 2015 during a complete lockdown that encompassed several provinces and many, many towns, and that lasted for several months without a break in certain places. You talked about specifically one story where an elderly woman was killed by gunshots from an armored vehicle, and her family fought to have her buried properly according to their own faith. The family, they appealed to the European Court of Human Rights, and that ended up in a certain way. So you use these examples to serve a purpose for your book. Tell me about what happened a little bit and then tell me why you chose that example. Please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Zena, for the introduction. I mean, perhaps just a few words about, by just by way of background and information in terms of why I wrote this book and how I wrote it. This is actually, the book itself, the story has been on my mind really for, well, maybe for 15 years, certainly over, maybe more than that. I met um, Kurdish lawyers, a group of Kurdish lawyers in Kurdish region back in 1998. At the time, I was a graduate student, a very young graduate student, a master's student in the U.S., and I was part of an international fact-finding mission, working as a translator to help American and Kurdish lawyers and legal experts talk to each other. And I was very, very impressed by the resilience of these lawyers because it was 98 um, there was mm -hmm. still a state of emergency in the Kurdish region this group of lawyers in the Abukur themselves arrested uh, they were held in prolonged um, detention at the, in the mid 90s on terrorism charges some of them were tortured subject to ill treatment and I was really really impressed um, and they among other things they told us about um, their ECHR European Court of Human Rights I'll call it ECHR just because I'm used to it yeah Sure. ECHR um, litigation, you know, that they, you know, took their cases to the ECHR. And by then already they had won a few uh, landmark judgments, really. And mm -hmm. I was very, very impressed by this. You know, how is it that these very, they were in their early 30s. Um, and um, how is it that they really managed to litigate at the ECHR under emergency conditions, although none of them mm -hmm. spoke were English, they didn't have international connections. Um, they did not, until they, you know, petitioned the ECHR, didn't know anything about the European Convention on Human Rights or the individual petition mechanism, um, etc. So I was truly, truly impressed. So, and then, you know, years, you know, I ended up studying law myself in the United mm -hmm. States. And then, but then I went back to Turkey afterwards to be part of the democratization process at the time, what, you know, we believed that it, something was happening in mm -hmm. Turkey and started working at a think tank. And during that time, I reconnected with them many of them. And, and I had really multifaceted relationship um, with them. I started doing field research, academic research, so field work um, on various issues, internal displacement, human rights, etc. So I interviewed some of them. We at the think tank that I worked, Turkish Economic and Social Studies at the time, TESEF mm -hmm. Foundation, we did um, collab collaborative projects together with bar associations and NGOs in the region. I became friends, very good friends with some of them. So I was always in touch, you know, we would have dinners together. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, and of course I watched them, you know, I follow them. Um, you know, I did participate in observation in their internal meetings, et cetera, public gatherings. So this, but the idea, you know, the, I kept coming back to this. I always wanted to write the story. Days later, long story, I ended up doing a PhD at Master University, that PhD dissertation ended up this book, in this book that you mentioned, which was published by Cambridge University Press in November 2020. Now, so the story really, I mean, the my focus in terms of time frame is really between uh, 1987, which is the year when Turkey accepted the right to individual petition to the ECHR, and 2012, which is the year when the right to constitutional complaint entered into force in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So that's really the focus of the book, right? But, and the, the, the events that you alluded to at the entrance, which, which is how I indeed begin my book, that have, they started in summer 2015 and continued until end of 2016. The reason mm -hmm. I started with that story, Tibet Inan's story, and that 
you know, the curfews and the gross violations is to really, first of all, it's really, it's just a remarkable and in the very negative sense, of course, mm-hmm. story, you know, I mean, ha- and, and of course that happened in 2015 in a se- and this is really different from the 90s in a way, in the sense that by 2015, Turkey was an EU accession country. Mm-hmm. So it seemed to have fulfilled the Copenhagen political criteria where there's supposedly rule of law, democracy, etc. And at the time when the EU, in the leadership of the German government, was engaged in really deals <laughs> with the Turkish government for, for this migration, you know, the infamous mm-hmm. migration deal. That was happening around that time. And yet this woman, this old woman, as you said, she was shot um, down in front of her house because she happened to be outside during the curfew. I mean, what was she doing? She was literally coming back home, visiting exactly. her neighbor across the street. You know, that's mm-hmm. all she was doing. And, and you know, she bled to death there, not just her, but also her, her brother-in-law who stepped out to help her. I mean, I won't get into the details of that, but it's just that, I mean, how could that happen? You know, how could yeah. in 2015 in Turkey, a civilian is just basically executed in, you know, in that lovely death families attempt to get an ambulance fall in deaf ears they're not allowed to um, bury her they're not even allowed to hold a religious ceremony by her grave after she's already buried by the authorities and that all of this happens when lawyers are trying to desperately get the turkish constitutional court and the Mm -hmm. echr to intervene to at least allow her to be buried properly buried you know such an sort of a humane really request and another reason why I, want, I started with this is because it shows that although, as I said, my research really focused on until 2012, it shows that actually not much has changed in Turkey in the, mm-hmm. as far as the Kurdish question is concerned, right? And I also end in the, in the, in the, final, in the final chapter, I also um, end, uh, you know, I briefly sort of summarize the development since, two, since two, the end of 2012, just showing that all of this and, and also what happened since the failed coup in July 2016, both in terms of what happened domestically in Turkey and how ECHR reacted to that, just shows Mm -hmm. basically serves to um, affirm my reasonings and conclusions. That's why I started like that. So as a bit of context, um, this death, these deaths actually, uh, happened at a time when the official discourse was the Kurdish question has changed and now everything is better and the atrocities that used to happen are a thing of the past and like this this was how the official narrative kind of evolved and the curfews that started in these towns and provinces they came after the failure of a peace process that lasted between Mm. 2013 and 2015 and this was immediately after almost immediately after the rekindling of the conflict so this it appears that not only the conflict started again but everything sort of went back to how it was in a sense like and in and these things happening in front of the whole world to seek because it was Mm -hmm. uh there was a lot of news stories coming out of the region as these things were happening Mm -hmm. um this sort of maybe introduced a new generation to what was what had been happening in um part of turkey maybe that's another aspect of the significance of these stories maybe you said um the the inan family they they appealed to the constitutional court uh let's maybe talk about that process a little bit well i mean you know what they went their experience of course was kind of emblematic of the experience of other families of Mm -hmm. course they they had different you know there were dozens of applications made to the turkish constitutional court seeking interim measures Mm -hmm. you know the constitutional court to really intervene um, yeah. They all had different needs and demands, right? I mean, there was a case, for example, of pregnant, very, um, very pregnant a woman, you know, towards the end of her term, yeah. who wasn't, you know, allowed to leave. Um, a disabled young man, um, young boy, really, you know, trapped in the curfew zone. In the Inan's family's case, she was already dead, you know, but but she was um, her body first. I mean, her body stayed on the street for yeah. seven days. That's, I mean, that's just, you know. I think I think it's important to also mention this, you know, that not only that she bled to death, um, which took several, several, several hours, and she bled to death in front of her family's eyes. They watched her to death, you mm-hmm. know, because they could see from the house she was on the street and her brother-in-law was in the courtyard. Mm-hmm. So both of them, you know, 
I mean, just imagine the, and that's also why I chose it because really I, I thought of my own mother. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, what an agony, you know, you watch your mother die and you just help us. You cannot do anything. She's right there. So, you know, they, 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 they called how many times the police emergency line asking for ambulances, ambulances didn't come. Then they called again. They said, okay, ambulances are not coming. Let us go out. Let us bring an ambulance. And the authorities said, yes, you can do it. Just carry a white flag and then you will, you'll be fine. They oblige and that they were still shot at, you know, exactly. and that's how. Uh, her her husband also got injured luckily he survived Mm -hmm. so this this kind of like you know desperateness and then and then she dies and then the body lays there for seven days just imagine this I mean and also it's a devout family there's also the religious aspect of that I guess I mean it's Mm -hmm. painful to everyone of course but you know for devout Muslims it's really important to expeditiously bury the body you know not to wait and then she was there and and then they at least and then so but you know what they wanted was to um, first they asked to be able to bury the body themselves up to the Turkish constitutional court mm-hmm. uh, the court didn't even respond you know I mean just imagine I mean the, what else do you need a rem- interim measure for this is exactly. such an urgent situation you know there's a dead body on the street and then the family goes to the ECHR the government of course find out that the family petitions the ECHR and, and that they do something uh, Turkish state typically does authoritarian regimes do you mm-hmm. know they all they have this playbook you know of, this is a term that's used a lot they adapt they change the regulation concerning burials and they basically authorize local governments to uh bury themselves bodies that are not claimed by the authorities and then they go to Tibet's house and they ask her illiterate the only one at home, I understand at the moment, he's illiterate. They ask him to sign this paper that, you know, authorizing basically the government to bury her uh, the unless morning. the family claims um, the body until 9 a.m. the next morning or something. And this is evening already. So by the time the family, rest of the family knows what's going on, she's buried by the authorities. This time then, what they want from the family, wants from the ECHR, of course, is something else. They're saying, oh, okay, let's at least hold a religious service, you know, but by the grave. And then the ECHR denies on the ground that she's already buried. I mean, of course she's buried, but mm-hmm. that's not what they're mm-hmm. asking. It's just this whole this whole story. I mean, I discuss it at length. Um, and also the fact that when she was buried by the authorities, she had 11 children. Mm-hmm. Only two, um, two of, of her children were allowed to be there. I mean, just imagine you're on top of that. Yes. You're denied uh, to say goodbye to your mother. It's just basically what this shows is that it's nothing new, of course, but this, this sort of not just utter disregard of human life but also dignity the sort of this really exactly. it gives a message to the kurdish people no that that you really don't matter your religious place don't matter your life doesn't matter your family bonds don't matter you're just not worth a thing and we'll we'll just do whatever you want with you live or dead you know and and the fact that the chr did not see this i just I mean, I wasn't very surprised, but you still is a surprise. You know, you kind of have these very mm-hmm. different feelings when you look at these cases. I mean, how, how did they do that? How really did they do that? The way they did it, of course, was they completely deferred to the Turkish Constitutional Court. Mm-hmm. ECHR said, you know, uh, and, and that, uh, that has been very um, emblematic, really, since 2012, when the mm-hmm. uh, constitutional complaint mechanism and um, enforced in Turkey, this kind of almost, well, really unquestioning deference to the Turkish Constitutional Court, you know, that if, if, if the court has um, ruled in a way, then, then it is true because it's an effective domestic remedy, this ECHR's eyes. It does seem to be a turning point that the Constitutional Court steps into, into the process. And before this, we see a lot of convictions against Turkey in the, in the case of um, several hundred cases in uh-huh. the 90s, we see many convictions for Turkey. Turkey is ordered to pay compensation and I think not much else, right? After 2012, maybe, we see a shift in this trend. So why do you think this is? You mean a change in the sense of... Like, uh, more cases are being rejected, more cases hmm, okay, are yeah, lost yeah, in yeah, the sense, in, yeah, in terms yeah. of the applicants. Yeah, exactly. And I would, if I may, Zena, perhaps briefly sure. um, actually take our listeners a little back in time, just a little bit, you know, I don't want to sort of um, talk too much about this, but <laughs> I think it's important to understand the context. You're right. You know, in the, the one chapter of my book is about, is really a very detailed, in, you know, process oriented sort of in-depth analysis of the ECHR's 
case law on um, gross violations. I should also add that my focus is on gross human rights violations, gross and systematic, namely extrajudicial executions, enforced disappearances, torture, and forced displacement and property destruction. Mm -hmm. I do also secondarily look at the Kurds' political and cultural rights claims. I do that in another chapter and how the ECHR responded. But really, my focus is state violence, right? And when you look at the ECHR's jurisprudence and how it has evolved, you see that there are actually cycles, right? There's no one story. It is impossible, and it's really incorrect, to make one sort of general conclusion about the ECHR's take on these cases. So there are cycles, and I identified three broad cycles. Of, uh, you know, we can, of course, expand on this. But the first mm -hmm. one is the 90s, right? First judgment is issued in 1996. So the first phase, what I call the first phase, is really um, starts from the mid, you know, 1996, really, well, earlier than that, you know, mid 90s to uh, early 2000s. So during this time, you see a court, which is the ECHR I'm talking about, of course, which is relatively speaking open to the justiciable claims of Kurdish victims, open to Kurdish legal mobilization, quite understanding of the kind of you know, small procedural errors um, that they make in their applications, very um, sort of flexible, really, in its admissibility rules. Not on its evidentiary rules. I mean, there's also a lot mm -hmm. to criticize in this period as well, and we can talk about it later if you want. But more or less speaking, you know, sort of a court that sort of in understanding that in recognition of the fact that there are no effective domestic remedies, basically, mm -hmm. that the Turkish judiciary was not doing anything, was not exercising any function in terms of overseeing the authorities, and that there was actually judicial complicity. These are, of course, I'm mm -hmm. saying that the ECHR mm -hmm. never said that, but you know, you see that there was a you know, recognition of that. So they basically allowed, of course, on a case-by-case -case basis, on an individual basis, the Kurdish victims to directly come to ECS Strasbourg without having to exhaust domestic remedies, right? Because the domestic remedies weren't functioning. Of course, here, the court could have done more, which is what the Kurdish lawyers asked, mm -hmm. to actually find and conclude and declare that there was an administrative practice, a state policy of violence, basically, that this was a matter of state policy, people were being disappeared and executed, and that this was discriminatory because it was against the Kurds only. And that would have made things much easier in a way for, for in terms of uh, admissibility. But at this time, every case had to kind of start with proving that this was a thing that happened to Kurds exactly. in a systematic way. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Even if those those claims were made, and they were made, mm -hmm. the court was always close to those claims, to discrimination claims and administrative practice claims. The court never accepted these. What it did allow, really, was to say, okay, you can, on a case-by-case -case basis, I'm going to, you can come to me, you, you know, for those violations that occurred in the emergency region, right? Um, mm -hmm. You can come to me directly without exhausting domestic remedies because it showed that domestic remedies basically effectively didn't exist. It was impossible to, to exhaust them. But the thing is, had it found an administrative practice, mm -hmm. that would have alleviated the applicants from this burden. You see, then they would not have to show that they tried to exhaust the domestic remedies. Mm -hmm. The court didn't do it. But still, what you see in this period is, a, you know, sort of flexible, more or less open court and very strong judgments, Right. And these were precedent set in judgments. What the Kurdish lawyers and act victims did really set precedent for the entire Council of Europe, for the entire convention mechanism, finding, um, for example, that rape under detention is torture. That's the Shukran Aydin case, that there's no need to exhaust domestic remedies when domestic remedies are not effective and adequate. That's the Octavar case. That enforced disappearance can also constitute ill treatment for the family, etc. So there are all these, that comes until the 2000s. Then early 2000s, the Turkish government changes the strategy slowly. And that's where the change starts. And this is important, I think, because this is, you mm -hmm. don't see much about this in the literature, really. There were a few articles written back then, but that was it. The court, the government sees that, okay, we're losing all these cases, right? We're paying a lot of judgment, but more importantly, you know, we're being named and shamed. So let's try actually to prevent admitted cases to result in violations, right? To judgments, judgments where the court finds violations. How does it do that? First, the government turns to the applicants themselves, the applicants, Kurdish applicants, whose cases were already admitted and who were now waiting for a judgment, right? Turkish government said, let's settle this, right? Friendly settlement. That's what they over. You know, I'm going to pay you some compensation. Let's just settle this. And when the victims views, the Turkish government then turned to the court and issued these unilateral declarations, basically saying all, I mean, all that they said was indirectly accepted that, that they're, well, not even that, basically saying, let's say excessive use of force is a violation of right to life, but that's it. But didn't accept its own responsibility, didn't accept that there was a violation here, didn't promise 
um, reforms, etc. Briefly, there was a brief phase where the ECHR actually accepted these unilateral declarations and dismissed, rejected these cases on the basis of uh, basically penalized the Kurdish applicants, you know, for not accepting the government's settlement, uh, settlement offers. Mm -hmm. Then the Grand Chamber intervened, so that's ended. Then came the mid 2000s. So this is already happening. Mid 2000s, by now, AKP is in power. Uh, the Justice and Development Party of um, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. AKP was very smart about this, right? So they came to office in a very um, pro-EU agenda, and they immediately changed the government policy. Because until then, also in the 1990s, the Turkish government was denying, categorically denying all the allegations, not cooperating with the, with the ECHR, mm -hmm. not ensuring, for example, the uh, attendance of witnesses summoned by the ECHR in fact-finding hearings, not sharing information, not sharing documents, etc., the Erdogan government, what they did is, you know, we're opening a new phase. We're going to start collaborate with the international community, including the ECHR. So they really be start to be much more collaborative. And then they passed these EU reforms, right? The Really, the goal wasn't ECHR. The goal wasn't to execute ECHR judgments, really, was to get an accession status with the EU because the EU had made Turkey's execution of ECHR judgments a condition for accession, right? It had to do it. So among the things that the Turkish government did is to pass this compensation law in 2006, right? It's a law that was passed to give compensation to, quote, victims of terrorism and counterterrorism. The real goal was, because there were thousands of Kurdish cases that were still waiting before the ECHR, the government knew that, and they particularly targeted these um, group of cases concerning forced displacement, right? Mm -hmm. And so the government said, you know, I'm going to give compensation. And the ECHR, based on this law, before the law hardly even entered into force, found the law and the commissions established under the law to be effective remedy, domestic remedy, and issued an inadmissibility decision mm -hmm. rejecting a total of 1,500 cases. I mean, the numbers are a bit ambiguous because the yeah, court yeah. somewhere says 800, somewhere says 50. The court itself is not clear about this, but somewhere 800 to 1,500. But that's really remarkable. And that happened with the Ichiar decision. And that was 2006. So if you ask the Kurdish lawyers, they don't talk much about this first thing that I told you about, the first phase, the unilateral declaration declarations, the Akman judgment, for example, or TA judgment, Tahsin Ajar, that those are the judgments I was talking about. But the ECR decision really was a turning point for the Kurdish lawyers, because it really, with one single decision, the court to drastically changed its image in the eyes of the Kurdish lawyers, and its legitimacy was shattered. Right? Because the reason why they were so disappointed and could not believe is that the court contradicted its own jurisprudence. Because until then, court had said time and again, pretty much in every judgment, that effective remedy under Article 13 of the European Convention on Human Rights means, when you're talking about state violence, when you're talking about gross human rights violations, requires not just compensating the victims, but also holding perpetrators accountable. So there's compensation mm -hmm. and there's justice. The compensation law in Turkey provided only compensation. There was no, there was no talk even of justice. Yet the court approved it. Right? And then came 2012, where the AKP government this time said, okay, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is really a more wholesale sort of solution, not just the Kurdish cases, but mm -hmm. all cases, right, by introducing yet another layer of domestic remedy, which is the constitutional complaint mechanism, which again was a requirement of the EU. But this time, the goal was not just because by then Turkey was already in it, had accession status, and it was abundantly clear that the EU process wasn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. But the ECHR was still there. There were all these, you know, thousands of hundreds of thousands of cases. And the Turkish government said, you know, I'm going to introduce a constitutional complaint mechanism. Mm -hmm. This is around the time that the European Union actually expanded and the Council of Europe had new members and so the caseload of the courts was also increased right exactly very <laughs> exactly very true I mean of course Erdogan you know the government was aware of that right I mean there was um the court already had a very um problem with its docket but then until the enlargement, but with the enlargement and accession of post communist countries, it just became unmanageable. It, and that's true, right? The court has a bucket mm -hmm. crisis. That, that is undeniable. So that's what I discuss in the book also. You know, all, there are all these domestic and international legal political developments that are happening that then define the sort of where one cycle ends, another cycle begins. So the government found uh, an ECHR that was very prone to cooperation, that was more than ready for that. That's why the ECHR has been so, you know, by invoking the principle of subsidiarity, it was so open really to send cases to immediately back to the Turkish domestic legal system for the exhaustion of domestic remedies. So this is how the court treated cases coming from Turkey. So one reason is uh, apparently the sheer volume of cases coming from Turkey on top of the already high caseload of the court. But barring the unwillingness to 
maybe resolve the political aspect of these cases. How could the ECHR have been more effective? What could the court have done that didn't do? Thank you for this question. I mean, because that really allows me to um, sort of talk briefly about my main argument really in the Mm -hmm. book. I take the ECHR's involvement in the Kurdish question as a case study to draw sort of generalizable conclusions about supranational human rights courts and and authoritarian regimes, right? So the question I ask is this, is effective oversight, supranational judicial oversight of authoritarian regimes possible? What are the limits? What are the possibilities? What are the limitations? And I'm particularly talking about authoritarian regimes engaged in state violence against minorities. This is very important because state violence concerns gross and systematic human rights abuses. So that's really, these are the kind of violations where the need for human rights courts is highest, right? Mm-hmm. That's where you really, you really need, if somebody is disappeared, you know, by the authorities, you do need a human rights court but, and when the domestic judiciary is not doing anything. And the minority part is also very important, in this case, the Kurds, because by definition, minorities are subjugated, really, the behest of the majority, right? Because they will never, they just are not allowed, able to come to power, right? Unless they do so with coalition, etc. So they're not able to really change the rules of the game Mm -hmm. to, you know, by politics. So therefore, these are the cases where judicial review is really important domestically and internationally for the protection of minorities. So that's the research question I'm asking, right? And authoritarian regimes are important because in authoritarian regimes or autocracies, there is in these circumstances, the, the need for supranational judicial oversight is very, very high because courts, domestic courts, don't do their work, right? There's judicial compliance. Mm -hmm. The courts are basically an agent of the state. So state violence is undertaken by the involvement of all the state's apparatus, including courts, right? So that's the question I'm asking. And it's important also to maybe briefly talk about what I mean by effectiveness, because when you look at Mm -hmm. literature and political science scholarship, legal scholarship, effectiveness, I mean, we don't really have a good sort of theory on this yet. And if oftentimes effectiveness is associated with compliance, meaning if governments comply with judgments of supranational courts, they're effective. Now, this Mm -hmm. is a very shallow understanding of effectiveness and certainly doesn't explain the relationship with authoritarian regimes because, I mean, on the surface of it, Turkey has always complied. They've always paid the compensation, right? Because Mm -hmm. generally the court, that's what the court has ordered in most cases. Russia too, right? They paid the compensation. Mm -hmm. But so they comply. Well, first of all, what does compliance mean? But anyway, effectiveness, because what I'm arguing is that when it comes to authoritarian regimes, the expectation from supranational courts cannot be to change government behavior because authoritarian regimes really don't change. I'm talking about domestic policies, right? They don't stop the violations. So in understanding effectiveness, I think we try to, what I'm saying is there are two questions that I'm asking. One, has the supranational court in question, in this case, the CHR, in colloquial terms, done its best, right? Mm -hmm. Could it have done something more? Mm -hmm. And in more sort of uh, maybe more more legal terms, has it really exhausted its jurisprudential tools and resources? Has it used all everything in its power Mm -hmm. in looking at these cases? And the second is more the legal mobilization aspect of it. Is it open? Has it been open and remained open to victims and their lawyers, right? So these are the two questions that I'm asking. And when you look at the first, the court has never, even in this first phase that I talked, and I call that the golden age, you know, the peak Mm -hmm. of its engagement in the Kurdish cases, even then the court has never exhausted its tools and resources. What I mean by that, I mentioned already before, and the Article 14, this anti-discrimination, you know, the convention provision prohibiting discrimination. The court never mm-hmm. found discrimination against the Kurds, which is, of course, remarkable. No, I should always also say this is not typical. I mean, that's more characteristic of the court's jurisprudence in general. Never found administrative practice, although there was one. It did hold fact-finding here initially. Um, mm-hmm. against Turkey. And, and they were very important because what basically happened was because the Turkish judiciary wasn't doing anything, there was no investigation at, at all. And the Turkish government was flatly denying all the allegations. The court had to basically determine the facts itself. And so the commission at the time, we had the European Commission on Human Rights, the commission came to Ankara, to Diyarbakir, to hold hearings, to talk to victims, to mm-hmm. um, get the testimony of government officials, etc., to really, really function as a first instance court, which is something very extraordinary for a supranational court to do that. They did that, but then they stopped doing it. And that, I think, is a mistake. Another thing is Article 46 judgments, what are they called? What they're called Article 46 judgments, where the court goes beyond ordering compensation 
but also asks the government to take certain measures to put an end to these violations. The court always had that authority under 46, right? And only in the two, mid 2000s, the court started to issue those judgments very, very late. For example, one case mm-hmm. the court could have said was stop the village guard system. These are the use of civilians as paramilitary forces armed and paid by the government. On evidence, what I find really just incredible from a human rights perspective really, is that the court has a very high standard of proof, evidentiary, you know, standard of proof. It's, you know, beyond reasonable doubt. Mm-hmm. It expects applicants, human rights victims, to prove their allegations beyond reasonable doubt, which really is a threshold from criminal law. I mean, in criminal law, that's normal, right? But in yes. human rights cases, is that really necessary? And the court and never is it made possible, exception. maybe, is... Is a good exactly. question. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Because just think about Zeynep Hanum. I mean, we're talking about enforced disappearance, right? The Kurdish victim comes and says, the state disappeared my son. Mm-hmm. And then the court says, prove it. So prove, <laughs> for example, first, that How? he has really disappeared, right? Second, prove state responsibility, meaning prove the detention. And mm-hmm. then they ask, and the court asks the Turkish government, the Turkish government says, gives all these, you know, pr- submits these custody logs, which are, of course, false. Says, no, we never even detained him. He was never detained. So how can you, in such a case, and when you have an authoritarian when the courts, domestic courts, don't do anything, prosecutors don't do investigations. So all you have really is he said, she said. Mm -hmm. Even in these cases, the court did not lower its threshold, which, by the way, I should also notice, was criticized within the court too. There were dissenting, very strong dissenting opinions. Mm -hmm. Circumstantial evidence. One of the things that the court could have said, for example, okay, in these cases, because state is, you know, the government is denying, I'm going to accept circumstantial evidence, meaning media Mm -hmm. reports, reports of international domestic human rights bodies, etc. And what is interesting is that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which is another supranational human rights court for the, inter- for the Americans, they did all of that. And from the first judgment, you know, and their third, first judgment happened to concern enforced disappearance case against Honduras, a very famous Velaz- mm-hmm. Velazquez Rodriguez versus Honduras judgment. There, the court did everything that the ECHR didn't do. And the ECHR didn't do it, although it issued hundreds of judgments, you know, judgment after judgment, the similar case keeps coming before the court, uh, ECHR, I mean, but the inter-American courts from the first case said, A, first, they accepted circumstantial evidence, they accepted media reports, they accepted human rights reports, and based on that, basically drew a picture, a profile, a victim profile, and concluded not just the applicant's son, I suppose, I don't remember now, in that case was disappeared, but that there was a policy in Honduras of enforced disappearances. In the case of Turkey, the ECHR did not even accept Turkish parliament's reports on extrajudicial execution, for example, Mm -hmm. as circumstantial evidence, or the Council of Europe's non-judicial bodies, you know, the torture committee, the UN, various committees um, and representatives, all of that, all of that was there. That's what I mean, that the court has never exhausted. They could have done more. Again, I'm not saying that had the court done all of this, Turkey would have stopped disappearing people, although I think it could have worked when the EU was still an important actor in Turkey, right? So there was this phase, it was a golden, it's a missed opportunity. But at least it would have been effective in the sense that at least it would have put pressure on Turkey. It would have helped the Kurdish victims to raise international awareness. I mean, you mentioned earlier, you know, you started with the 2015 events and mentioned that, you know, there was press coverage about it. But, you know, I was Mm -hmm. in Europe. Here, there was nothing about that. Europeans Still don't know what happened in Turkey, right? Right. Had the ECHR intervened, had the ECHR issued the interim measures, the story would have been different. So at least in terms of recognition, and of course, there's the element of having your day in court, very important for victims of gross violations, at least to have some some judge to listen to them, right? Even if um, it's a supranational. So in that sense, I argue um, that the ECHR actually has not been effective. And it's interesting mm-hmm. because the foregone conclusion scholarship is that it's been the world's most effective human rights court. But of course, it doesn't explain the Turkish case. You do mention in the book that scholarship on the court often treats Turkey as an exception and like it says the court is exceptionally effective except in this case which is the Turkey's case and I remember in recent months uh, we saw several cases of disappearances they've Mm -hmm. fortunately been very short disappearances but it makes you think that maybe if we didn't have the tools that we have now at our disposal, these could have turned into what happened in the 90s. Um, I remember one story from a couple weeks ago, actually, where the brother or the nephew of prominent political family made prominent due to state violence again. The son gets taken into police custody. And then when the family inquires, they are told that he isn't in custody. And Mm -hmm. they file a missing persons report and say, okay, if he's not in custody, our son is missing. And it turns out that six days later, this 
man turns out and he says that he was held in a torture center mm. for six days and yeah and Gökhan Güneş face <laughs> exactly so this maybe took only six days in 2021 because of social media because exactly. everybody has a yeah. phone because we have recordings exactly. of this man being taken into the car and like driving away and we have proof we have physical evidence at regular civilians disposal to actually prove something so basically we can say maybe that the way the court treated these cases in the 90s when the, these tools were not available to anybody maybe that behavior was more appropriate for this time and even maybe not today because not everybody can record everything even like now we can prove it and now these people turn up but maybe this is indicative of what actually happened 20 years ago sure i mean the thing is then also, there were many cases where, at least, you know, several cases where, of course, there was no social media, as you said, or, you know, mm-hmm. CC footage, but there were eyewitnesses, right? There were um, cases where people saw individuals being, you know, grabbed from the street and put, at the time, mm-hmm. there was white Renault cars with license plates. And so the li- they had the license plate, right? They would go to prosecutors, and including lawyers, right? That Kurdish lawyers that I talked to, say, they said, you know, like there was one case where they literally saw this car drive into the parking lot of police station and later saw the car around so it was it belonged to the police and yet the, the investigators didn't uh, prosecutors didn't do anything and and actually in what is going on in the Kurdish region with the curfews etc etc is also not that, that difference I think one other difference is is I think when it happens in the Kurdish region especially under the security uh, under the emergency rule it is perceived somehow to be different also by the domestic community and international community than when it happens in Istanbul, Ankara, in, you know, in the middle of, uh, in the eyes of everything. And so one of the things that I'm arguing in the book is that the reason why, because, because one reason is why, right? Why has the ECHR done this? I mean, why, mm-hmm. why were they not stronger enough now, especially in the 90s when they did not have a docket crisis, right? Because now everything is about that, yeah. right? basically. They just don't yeah. want to deal with these cases. And I, I mean, the reasons that I, that the, the explanation that I give is one has to do with counterterrorism, And I think that's really important because the government, the Turkish government, always use that counterterrorism defense, right? Mm-hmm. And they said, well, I mean, even if violations occurred, they were unintended to the consequences of counterterrorism. So I think one of the biggest misfortunes of um, the victims and the Kurdish lawyers who were trying to get relief from the CHR was the PKK and the armed conflict. So long as you have that, the international community, certainly in Europe, the EU too, always kind of is much more differential to the Turk, to the government, right? They, they will give, and the government in the ECHR in its speak will give wider margin of appreciation, more room for maneuver to the government. But they never really, the ECHR never also questioned it. Another, I mean, going back to tools and resources, emergencies by definition are supposed to be temporary, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, governments can resort to an emergency, but there has to be a threat to the life of the nation, for example, and they're supposed to be uh, temporary. In the Kurdish region, we had emergency rule for 15 years, 15 years. And the ECHR never questioned that, never. So that's a question. Why don't you question mm-hmm. that, right? Why don't you ask whether there was actually really a need for emergency? And let alone that, they didn't even engage in a proportionality review to see whether these measures were necessary. All they did was that they said, you know, I mean, you know, if you have ret- detention, you can have detention, but not so long. You know, so that's mm-hmm. kind of, that kind of, they did that. But otherwise, and what is interesting, because the ECHR actually had done that against Greece once, when the Greek junta mm-hmm. after coup d'etat declared emergency ruled in greece and and the european commission on human rights did a fact-finding mission they said no no i'm not going to take your word for that i'm going to go and look whether there's public emergency and they concluded that there wasn't mm-hmm. i think that also goes to another sort of argument that i'm making is that the underlying reason i think is that for dchr dchr and the council of europe in general always treated Turkey as a democracy. They, right. based on a very procedural understanding of democracy. Okay, you have representative institutions, you know, regular and fair elections. free elections, which of course also has become quite uh, questionable lately. So that's good enough, right? Uh-huh. They never really, I mean, the fact that Turkey still today, for example, is governed by a constitution and laws governing the entire walk of life by laws and constitution drafted by the junta after mm-hmm. 19, the 80 coup d'etat. 1980. This, this 1980, yeah, this, this just doesn't, is not recognized. So this is an authoritarian uh, regime and, and its legal regime is also authoritarian. But by treating it as a democracy, you see, the ECHR always granted sort of discretion 
Mm -hmm. It was very discretionary to the government. And I think that's the underlying reason. And then there are other broader reasons which explain not just ECHR, but the entire system's ineffectiveness, because there are also political measures that can be done. There are legal measures that can mm -hmm. be done by the member states. Interstate cases, for example, member states can bring into cases against Turkey. Today, they can do it still. Or... <laughs> committee of ministers can take infringement measures. Uh, the Council of Europe can suspend Turkey's membership. All of these too. None of that has been done. And I think the main reason for that is is geopolitics. The fact that Turkey has a real politics, sorry, to Turkey, that Turkey's geopolitics has always been important, right? First, it was the Cold War. Then after 9-11, it was its proximity to the Islamic world. Now you have the refugee crisis. There's always something. And I think that's for us, people of Turkey, that's our maybe biggest more misfortune that were so important in a way for the political and military interests of the western world right <laughs> um you paint a dark picture for sure actually we do see another shift this is a very recent shift i think maybe with a few years back you said turkey did used to comply with European Court of Human Rights mm, uh, yeah. rulings. But we see now in very high profile cases that Turkish courts are flat out refusing to comply with HR's decisions. And then Turkish officials, including the president and top ministers, flat out saying that the ECHR is not binding for Turkey, which it mm. is according to the constitution and the, the treaties signed with the Council of Europe. What does this mean? for the courts, for the Council of Europe and for Turkey, this decision to openly defy or uh, refuse to comply with the rulings of the ECHR. Yeah, no, you, uh, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So sort of taken to the next level. I mean, obviously, legally, Turkey is bound. I mean, there's no question about that. I think there's no need to even discuss that. And a footnote here, Turkey is actually one of the drafters of the European Convention on Human Rights. So it's not... That's also amazing, important to, to remember. It was, it's been part of the system from the beginning. I mean, I think it just goes to show how, in a way, the Turkish, well, a couple of things, I think. One is, there are certain, as you said, you know, they do so, especially in very high profile cases, such as the Demirtas judgment, of course, Salatin Demirtas. So the former co-chair of the pro-Kurdish People's Democratic Party in Turkey. Exactly, exactly. Salatin Demirtas. Who, Exactly. Who Erdogan rightly perceived to be a significant, serious political threat to him. For the first time, a Kurdish politician from a pro-Kurdish political party became so popular in the among eyes Turks. of mainstream among Turks. Right. Yeah. And he, he ran for presidential um, in the presidential elections. Of course, he didn't get much, but much, much more than his political party gets in national elections. And so he really emerged as a serious contender. He could possibly uh, be a, a serious contender to Erdogan. So it is an Erdogan's every interest, personal interest, to keep Demirtas in jail. Mm -hmm. So when the ECHR Grand Chamber, in this case, issued such a strong judgment and for ordering his immediate, his immediate release. release, the question is, for Erdogan, like for any authoritarian leader, okay, what am I, you know, what are the, how to, you know, the, bal you know, he balances, right? What are the costs? Mm -hmm. What are the benefits? Non-complying with an ECHR judgment and declaring that, mm, okay, what is going to happen, right? The EU, and I think that Brings, we keep coming back to the EU. Had EU accession been a realistic mm -hmm. prospect for Turkey, I think this, he, they would not have done that, right? But Erdogan is in a place where, in his mind, he thinks that there's nothing he can get from the West, that his future lies elsewhere in the world with by, you know, becoming closer to, you know, Putin and the likes. And, and that, and anyway, that the EU and what is going to happen. And I think that's the, that's the most important thing. What is going to happen? Mm -hmm. Look at the past. We have, okay, maybe we've paid compensation, but we've really, Turkey never really complied with ECHR judgment in their essence, in terms of they kept violating, they engaged mm -hmm. in, you know, continuing to engage in same violations. And what happened? Nothing, right? What happened? Even nothing happens to Russia. The Russian Constitutional Court itself said a couple of years ago that they're going to selectively execute ECHR judgments. Russia is still a um, member of the Council of Europe. And I think that comes to Europe in general, Western mm -hmm. Europe, you know. They, they're, well, appeasement policies towards Turkey, and they're very ambivalent. The failure to embrace and claim their own law norms and principles and values against these basically authoritarian autocratic regimes. Erdogan knows very well, or believes, 
maybe rightly so, that he will not face serious sanctions, certainly not from the EU or not from the Council of Europe. Turkey will not be suspended. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, he will, naming and shaming doesn't matter because it's been, you know, he's been named and shamed so long, you see. He has much more to lose, he believes, I think rightly so, from Demirtas' release for his own personal political future than this crisis, let's put it that Mm -hmm. way, with the EU and the Council of Europe. I think so long as European governments, of course, you know, they're the ones that matter in the end, take it seriously and uh, give an anti-appeasement policy and take, you know, consider real sanctions. And I'm talking about, for example, cancelling Turkey's accession status, that kind of real, Mm -hmm. or suspending Turkey from the Council of Europe. Of course, it's going to do that because, you know, why not? I remember High Representative of the European Union, Josep Borrell, in November, I think, while the EU was discussing whether to impose sanctions on Turkey, I remember him saying that basically there was nothing much the European Union could do at the moment under its current structure because of the ability for one member to veto things. And he was basically saying that it's always possible for Russia, for Turkey, for whatever other country that the EU is trying to deal with. It's always possible for them to convince one member of the European Union to actually stand against any kind of action the union tries Mm. to take. So under these circumstances, it doesn't appear that Europe in general is in any way kind of willing to interfere with quote-unquote domestic Mm. issues in Turkey and this is how they apparently see it but is it Mm. domestic that's another question like well exactly um, because Turkey is actually violating EU law no exactly the accession criteria is part of the EU law they're undermining their own principles and values and norms Mm. and in that case I mean I don't know who Okay, in the case of Russia, you may imagine maybe Serbia or I mean, in the case of Turkey, who's going to do who who will that one member be to prevent sanctions? I mean, it's just all of this. I think when there's a political will, there's a way. Of course, they could do it, certainly against Turkey, because the one Russia is a different story. Russia is really powerful. But when you compare Turkey with the EU, I mean, who has the power here? The EU in every way, Uh, financially, just think of foreign direct investment. Think about all these, uh, you know, trade deals and agreements and etc. The accession status has a worth. It means it means basically EU is guaranteeing to the international community that Turkey is based on the rule of law. That's what it means. Mm-hmm. And hence comes the foreign direct investment. If it's suspended, well, what that's going to harm Turkey. It's just I I mean just to give you an example, um Navalny, of course, you know, the arrest of Navalny is mm-hmm. is terrible, has to be condemned, obviously. But just think of that. I mean, EU is going to introduce sanctions against Russia based on that. E- US has done so, if I'm not mistaken. Demirtas, mm-hmm. who is, who was the co-chair of a political party, which was the third largest political party in the Turkish parliament, second largest opposition party, who got votes of six million people in Turkey, who is an elected politician, who has democratic legitimacy, has been in jail on prolonged detention since November 2016. And there's the you know, Grand Chamber judgment finally about him. And yet what's going on? What's, ha- what's being, ha- you know, Mamadov, the famous Mamadov case in, against Azerbaijan, which is the first case where the Committee of Ministers actually used the infringement mechanism, available infringement mechanism against Azerbaijan because of its non-compliance with this judgment, concerned a leading NGO, a civil rights activist in Azerbaijan, certainly again, you know, held in arrest, which of course has to be, you know, done something. Thing. But it you know, was one person who was ar- arrested and held in detention and there was no compliance with ECHR judgment and the infringement mechanism was prolonged. Well, think about Kavala, think of everyone else. I mean, with Kavala, of course, there's also again an ECHR judgment calling for release. The, you know, I mean, there are like thousands of people, civil society organizations, activists, elected Kurdish mayors, elected Kurdish parliamentarians are in jail in wholesale. You know? mm-hmm. I, and yet, I just, you know, when you look at this whole, it's it's just, it's mind-boggling. I just, I find it really appalling. Right, exactly. So, well, you do paint a pessimistic picture. At this point, I want to ask, why do the Kurds, why do the Kurdish lawyers, why do they keep going to the ECHR? Why do we keep pushing for this avenue? Yeah, I mean, it's an important question, isn't it? Why, why keep going? And it's, of course, something that I asked lawyers themselves in in our interviews. I mean, the reason why they do is, well, first of all, you know, when you're a lawyer, you have to, you know, represent your client in in, in the best way and you have to do everything that you can. Um, You have to exhaust all available legal remedies to, to seek justice. So they, first of all, have a professional responsibility to do that. The other is, you know, one lawyer told me once, well, she said, she said, you know, it's become like a habit, you know, it's like, it's like going to the appeals court, you know, that's like the next thing you do. 
So they do it more out of habit than conviction because it's just that's what they've done. So they do, you know, okay, there's ECHR, let's go there, you know. But but it is, I think, I mean, it's really, it's sad in a way how the ECHR and the broader human rights community in Europe has in a way lost such a great and important ally. The Kurds have, Kurdish lawyers I'm talking about, have been there, you know, since the uh, early 90s, the first time they started mm-hmm. petitioning. DCHR, as I said earlier, they really, they wrote the bedrock of the court's jurisprudence, not wrote, of course, but they enabled, yeah, they facilitated, enabled the court, invited the court to address these issues, and which led to the emergence of the court's bedrock jurisprudence on state violence. And beyond that, the ECHR, very important, there's a very important judgment, the Opus case, which is very well known in the you know, human rights community which concerns violence against women and where the court for the first time found violence against women to constitute discrimination. This case is known by everybody. It's in every textbook. But ask uh, European legal experts and academics the names of the lawyers who got this, who won this judgment. They will not know. They are two Kurdish lawyers. Those two, actually, who were among the group of Kurdish lawyers that I met in 1998 that I mentioned earlier, who were tortured right. and held in pretrial termination. So they're, they're part, they are part of, actually, the human rights, European human rights community, mm-hmm. but they've never really been treated as such in a way. And it's just, it's really sad that they are so disillusioned with the ECHR and that the ECHR lost this very important ally. But of course, they are also cognizant that this is part of the struggle. You do your best to make your cases, you know, make your voice heard and, and, and just keep keep fighting. But I'm one other thing that I, I mean, we didn't get a chance to discuss that, but it is also in the book. Another thing that I'm, that I'm hoping in a way my book to contribute is perhaps to invite maybe Kurdish human rights lawyers themselves to, to look back you know, at this experience and to perhaps ask certain questions about why they hadn't been that effective. Mm -hmm. A lot of it has to do with the ACHR and certainly, of course, state violence is just impossible. I know, I mean, I'm not going to sit here as as somebody who never lived in the Kurdish region myself and have not been subject to state violence. It is is very, very difficult. So obviously they were fighting a mountain, but they could have also, there are, I think, lessons to draw there for them as well, for themselves, Mm -hmm. for their practice. Um, and I think that they have, in a way, undermined their own effectiveness to a certain degree, for example, by not staying in legal practice. You know, many of these lawyers that I mentioned have actually, Demir Tash himself, he mm-hmm. used to be a human rights lawyer. He used to be an ECHR litigant. And there's just sort of this, this uh, what is it called, revolving door between legal practice, human rights advocacy and politics in Turkey. Mm-hmm. I understand the reasons for that. Again, it's an authoritarian regime where lawyers don't really matter that much, where there's anyway rule of law. And I understand the frustration that lawyers, Kurdish lawyers, especially feel and why they may see political struggle as better means of gaining um, result. I understand why they're doing that. But as a result, what happened is people like Demirtas, again, he's not an exception. When they leave legal practice for politics, then this hard gained, very, very hard gained experience on ECHR litigation, human rights practice is also lost. You see, Mm -hmm. it doesn't then doesn't pass on the next generation. And then sort of the new Kurdish human rights lawyers that's almost start from scratch. And I think there are some hard questions for them to ask themselves as well as to why is it that they're not really, that still, they still don't have that much access to international networks. And they mm. are kind of, in, in Turkey, they are, they exercise individual practice. They tend to do this individually. So you don't really, they don't tend to cooperate and collaborate with each other in engaging in strategic litigation at the ECHR. They don't share much information with each other. It's a lot, it's sort of, you know, one lawyer takes the case and goes to Strasbourg rather than, you know, especially when important cases are concerned to really make an effort to to do a very good job too because it's important these cases are important and i think there's something to say about that too you're you're bringing up very interesting points but i do think this what you're describing has been changing from what i can see from the way new generation Mm. of lawyers kind of treats the cases but maybe as you say they could probably benefit from kind of evolving into a more like a guild kind of a understanding where they do teach 
their next person to come after them. Mm. But as I understand from what I what I read from your book and what you've talked about, this process, this experience of the last 30 years or so, this has been a very manual process of discovery. Like people have built themselves up, built up the practice. As you say, they didn't even speak any European languages when they started. Mm-hmm. So and mm-hmm. they didn't have international law experience. So this is an interesting way that I mean it 30 years is not a long time. And I think maybe what has been built up in this time can be considered quite significant. And we can maybe say that the shortcomings could be addressed as a part of the natural kind of evolution of Kurdish litigation, maybe. <laughs> what do you think? Well, yeah, but it's, yeah, it is, but it is also difficult. Many of the favorable conditions have been lost. Mm. Um, in, in the 1990s, part of the reason why the Kurdish cases were successful in the sense that they won these important judgments was because Kurds entered into transnational networks with British lawyers and British legal experts. I talked that, you know, tell that story at length in, in, in my book, but um, that really has been effective, not just because British lawyers actually helped them learn the ECHR and the individual petition, but also the Kurds got access to resources, financial resources, mm-hmm. material resources. That is not there anymore. The British lawyers also, they moved on to the Chechen cases, you know, and it's true, they did, you know, they kind of they left the Kurdish cases and they're now, they've been working on Russia. So mm-hmm. that's not there. As I said, a lot of the first generation, second generation Kurdish lawyers either entered into politics or left country, or some of them, I found them, some of them engaging in private practice in Istanbul Ankara, mm. you know, they're, they're completely withdrawn. The EU process is over. That's also important. Yeah. ECHR is not as open anymore. It has become much more difficult really to access the ECHR terms and stuff. And of course, Turkey, some level, has become even more authoritarian. So the, the, the mm-hmm. domestic judicial system. So in, in that sense, it's really very difficult. But, 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 of course, when you are a lawyer, when you're a Kurdish human rights lawyer, you have to, of course, take it very seriously. I think it is just, it is important that some sort of soul search, I think there's, there's a need for that, some sort of soul searching. Um, mm-hmm. um, what could have been done better? As you said, I mean, it's changing a little bit, but I think I know the kind of examples you have in mind. I think there are more, we're talking about more sort of Kurdish lawyers who studied in Istanbul, practiced in Istanbul. But when you look yeah. at the Kurdish region, it's different. It's different still. I think they need to be much more internationally oriented. Definitely learn English, you know, at least mm-hmm. and um, have, you know, have access to try and seek help and at least, you know, do, 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 do more there. Um, again, mm-hmm. I don't want to sound patronizing. I know it's very no, difficult, but, but it is important. It is absolutely important. Right. Okay. Well, <laughs> we try to have a high note, but this is not <laughs> a very optimistic situation, yeah. I guess. Do you have anything else you want to add? I think it's really this thing. I am a sociolegal scholar. I do, you know, it's, 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 a, it's mm-hmm. an approach. It's a discipline, interdisciplinary sort of approach to law, which, which sees really law as a as a tool both a tool of progressive change but as a tool of repression and and sees law in its context in political context that it's not ne- never just about law and that politics mm-hmm. matters and of course society matters etc i think of course we need to take echr seriously obviously but you know be cognizant of its limitations and also lack of willingness really and i think to recognize that really at this point what matters is politics and political pressure and i think that the the target of the you know us and i mean us by us meaning those who who care about democracy and human rights in turkey i think the target has to be the european public opinion Mm -hmm. who would then put pressure to their respective governments who would then perhaps act you know and i think that's really important you know being here in germany sort of that's i see that that's really important it's not easy it's easier said than done but I think we need to, and that's also why part of the reason why I wrote the book is not just because I wanted to have an academic book and you know uh, address um, the ECHR and academic scholarship, which I do, of course, but also to hopefully reach a broader audience through, of course, mediums such as Ahwa uh, um, podcast. And I thank you very much for hosting me today. And I do thank hope <laughs> uh, I do hope that my book will contribute, like many others, will be just a little sort of one more drop in that that in in getting the voices of Tibet Inan's family and other Kurdish victims heard and mm-hmm. and and mobilize international public opinion on this. So thank you very much for having me. Um, I thank you more <laughs> for being my <laughs> first guest on this new series. Yes, um... it's true. It was an honor. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All the best for the next interviews. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, well, this has been a very interesting conversation, really. Again, I thank you for sharing your time and expertise with me and with our audience well until 
your second book then. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Thank you. I, I like that one. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Dile Kurban was my guest today. And thank you for listening. Goodbye until my next interview then. <laughs> You can follow Ahval News Online podcast series through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Spreaker. All you need to know about Turkey is here for your ears, mind, and attention. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Thank you.